Mr Steve Baker. Mr Speaker, I beg to move that this House has considered the subject of money creation and society. The methods of money production in society today are profoundly corrupting in ways which would matter to everyone if they were clearly understood. The essence of this debate uh, is who should be allowed to create money, how and at whose risk. One of the most memorable quotes about money and banking is usually attributed to Henry Ford. He said, uh, it's well enough that people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system, for if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. Well, let's hope we don't have a revolution, Mr Speaker, because I feel sure we're all Conservatives on this side. How's it done? Well, the process is so simple, the mind is repelled. Whenever a bank <coughs> makes a loan, it simultaneously creates a matching deposit in the borrower's bank account, thereby creating new money. Many times I've been told that this is ridiculous, even by one employee who'd previously worked for the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation of the United States. The explanation is actually taken from the Bank of England article, Money Creation in the Modern Economy. It seems to me rather hard to dismiss. Today, while the state maintains a monopoly on the creation of notes and coins and central bank reserves, that monopoly has been diluted to give us a hybrid system because private banks can create claims on money, and those claims are precisely equivalent to uh, notes and coins in their economic function. It is a criminal offence to counterfeit banknotes or coins, but a banking licence is formal permission from the government to create equivalent money at interest. Now, there are a wide range of perspectives on whether this is legitimate. The, economist, uh, the Spanish economist Jesus Huerta de Soto explains in his book Money, Bank Credit and Economic Cycles that it is positively a fraud, um, a fraud which causes the business cycle. Positive Money, a British campaign group, are campaigning for the complete nationalisation of money production. On the other hand, free banking scholars George Selgin, Kevin Dowd, others, would argue that what should happen is uh, that uh, perhaps the state might define money in terms of a commodity like gold, but then banking should be conducted under the ordinary commercial law without legal privileges or of any kind. They would allow the issue of claims on money proper, backed by, or, uh, backed by other assets, provided that the issuer bore all of the risk. Now, some want the complete denationalisation of money. <coughs> Cryptocurrencies are now performing the task of showing us that that is possible. This argument that banks should not be allowed to create money has an honourable history. The 1844 Bank Charter Act was enacted because banks' issue of notes in excess of gold was causing economic chaos, particularly through reckless lending and imprudent speculation. And once again, I'm minded that the only thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. Absolutely right. I think it would be a wonderful thing if, uh, if the history curriculum covered uh, the 1844 Bank Charter Act in particular. It would be a, a delight. I'd be uh, full of joy. But of course we would need to cover economics too in order for people to really understand it. The, one of the problems with the Bank Charter Act, that was, it, was, it failed to recognise that bank deposits were functionally equivalent to notes, so it didn't succeed in its aims. There was a massive controversy at the time between the so-called currency school and the banking school. It appeared the currency school had won. In fact, in practice, the banks went on to create deposits drawn by cheque and uh, the ideas of the banking school went forward. But the, the idea that one school or the other uh, won it really ought to be rejected. The truth is we've ended up with something of a mess. Uh, we're in a debt crisis of historic proportions because for far too long profit-maximising banks have been lending money into existence as debt with too few effective restraints on their conduct and all the risks of doing so forced upon the taxpayer by the power of the state. A blend of legal privilege, private interest and political necessity has created over the centuries a system which today lawfully promotes the excesses which capitalism is so frequently condemned for. It is undermining faith in the market economy on which we rely not merely for our prosperity but for our lives. Now, thankfully, the institution of money is a human social institution and it can be changed. It has been changed and I believe it should be changed further. Even before QE began, we lived in an era of chronic uh, inflation, monetary inflation, unprecedented in the industrial age. Uh, between 1991 uh, and 2009, the money supply increased fourfold. It tripled between 1997 and 2010. 
from £700 billion to £2.2 trillion, accelerating into the crisis. Now, you just cannot increase the money supply at this rate without profound consequences. They are the consequences which are with us today. Just to return to where I wanted to go, where did all this money that was created as debt go? Well, when I look at the sectoral lending uh, figures, I see that some went into um, commercial property, there were some went into personal loans, credit cards and so on. Actually, the rise of lending into real productive businesses, excluding the financial sector, was relatively moderate. But overwhelmingly, where this new debt went was into mortgages and into the financial sector. Now, exchange and the distribution of wealth are part of the same social process. If you buy an apple, then the distribution of apples and money changes. If money is used to buy houses, then we shouldn't ex it, it, it would be at all surprised that if you increase the supply of money into houses, you boost the price of those homes. But I will give one. It's a, 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 it's a great debate. Uh, uh, but, but when you talk about ordinary people and their labour, because that's money as well, their labour, uh, to them it's like looking for the end of the universe when you're talking about money and capitalism and how it works. To them it's just a matter of, well, I need money to survive, and anything else is at the end of the, uh, the universe. Right, and I welcome the spirit in which he's asked the question. I mean, the vast majority of us live upon our labour. Uh, and it's absolutely true of all sides of the House, the vast majority of us live upon our labour. But what do we do? We work in order to exchange, obtain money, in order to obtain the things we need to, uh, on which to survive. And he's preempted another remark I wanted to make, which is that there's a categorical difference between earning your money through the sweat of your brow and making money by just creating it when you lend, some, lend it to somebody in exchange for a claim on the deeds to their house. It's fundamentally categorically different, and it goes to the heart of how capitalism works. I appreciate very little of this is going on in an election leaflet, but I think it nevertheless matters very much indeed. Perhaps I'll have to ask my opponent if he's followed the debate. But the point I'm making is this. If a great fountain of new money gushes up into the financial sector, we should not be surprised that we find that the banking system is far wealthier than anybody else. We shouldn't be surprised if financings, housing, uh, London and the South East are far wealthier than anywhere else. Indeed, I remember when QE began, when QE began, house prices started rising in Chiswick and Islington. The point is this, Mr Speaker, that money is not neutral. It redistributes real income from, from uh, later to earlier owners, that is, from the poor to the rich on the whole. Now, this distribution effect is key to understanding the effect of new money on society. I think it's the primary cause of almost all conflicts revolving about the, uh, around the production of money, the relations between uh, creditors and debtors. Having live, lived through this era where the money supply tripled through new lending, of course the whole system blows up. The real world catches up with this fiction of a monetary policy, and so QE was engaged in. Now, a paper from the Bank of England on the distributional effects of monetary policy explains that uh, people would have been worse off if the, if the bank had not engaged in it. It was, of course, an emergency measure. But one of the things the paper says is that asset purchases by the bank have pushed up the price of equities at least as much as they've pushed up the price of gilts. The bank's Andy Haldane said, we've deliberately, uh, I, I paraphrase, we've deliberately inflated the biggest bond market bubble in history. Yeah. I wonder what the Honourable Gentleman's view is about quantitative easing. How does he see that fitting into the great scheme of things? Yeah, I think it's quantitative easing, as, I, as I'm explaining. Quantitative easing is a, a great evil. Um, it's a substitute for proper reform of the banking system. But this is the point. If the greatest bubble has been blown in, uh, in the bond markets and, gilts have, uh, and equities have been pushed up by the, broadly the same amount, then that is a terrible risk to the financial system. I will. Given way. Surely there's a difference in where the quantitative easing goes to. In an, in an economy that's needed, that has a demand deficit and is needing demand stimulated, surely if quantitative easing is going to the pockets of those who are going to spend the money, quantitative easing can actually create some more emotion in the economy. But if quantitative easing is going into already deep pockets and making them bigger and larger and deeper, that's a very different thing. And he, he, he again touches on a very interesting issue. Once the bank legitimises the idea of money creation and giving it to people in order to get the economy going, the question then arises, why not give it to other people if you're going to create it and give it away? Well, this going goes, well, what is money? Well, I think money is the basis of a moral existence because we should be in our lives 
we should in our lives be exchanging value for value. One of the problems with the current system is we're not exchanging value for value. Something's being created in vast quantities out of nothing and given away. Now, the bank explains that 40% of the assets uh, bought, the assets that have been inflated, are held by 5% of households, 80% by people over 45. Which seems then very clear to me, if you'll allow me, seems to me very clear then that QE, a policy of the state to deeply intervene in money, is a deliberate policy of increasing the wealth of people who are older and wealthier. I'll give away. In short, if after prices have been, up through, been, been bid up by a, a credit expansion, they're bound to fall when later the real world catches up with it. It's why economies now are suffering this wrecking ball of inflation followed by deflation. And here is the rub, because throughout most of my life, the way that the monetary policy authorities have responded to these corrections has been to pump more new money. Previously, it's been through ever cheaper credit. Now it's been through QE. This raises the question of where this all goes. Back to the point my honourable friend for, for, for Stone provoked in me, that this might actually be pointing towards an end of this monetary order. Now, that is not necessarily something to be feared, because the monetary order changed several times in the 20th century. I'll finish by saying, well, what's to be done? A range of remedies are being proposed. They range from positive money's proposal to completely nationalise the production of money. Some want variations on a return to gold, perhaps with free banking, and some want the spontaneous emergence of alternative monies like Bitcoin. Order. The question is that this House has considered money creation and society. Mr Michael Meacher. Um, I, too, very strongly uh, congratulate the Honourable Member for Wickham uh, on securing this debate, uh, which I think uh, everyone recognises uh, is vitally important and which has not been debated uh, in this House, I believe, uh, for 170 years since the Robert Peel's uh, Bank Charter Act of 1844. And I remember the Honourable Member drawing my attention to that when we were both last speaking in a similar debate. Uh, and that uh, Act prohibited the private banks from printing uh, paper money. And in the light of the uh, financial crash of 2008-9 and the colossal expansion of money supply that underpinned it, uh, no less than an increase of 22-fold in the 30 neoliberal years between 1980 and 2010, I think the issue today is whether that prohibition uh, should be extended now to include electronic money. Uh, it is unfortunate, as um, the Honourable Gentleman referred to, uh, that it is so little understood by the public uh, that money uh, is created uh, every time by the banks that they make loans. Uh, in effect, they have a virtual monopoly, uh, something like 97% uh, over domestic credit creation, and it is the banks, therefore, the banks, which determine how money is allocated across the economy. Uh, and that has led to the vast majority of money being channelled into property markets and into the financial sector. According to Bank of England figures for the decade uh, to 2007, 31% of additional money created by bank lending went towards mortgage lending, 20% towards commercial property and 32% to the financial sector, including mergers and acquisitions and trading and financial markets. Those are really extraordinary figures. Oh, well, you have oh, yes, of course. Does he, on the basis of what he's just said, does he not think there's an argument for the Bank of England to intervene in that particular situation where you've got unlimited unlimit credit? From banks. Um, my, my honourable friend um, anticipates really the, uh, the main line of my argument, so if you could be patient, I think I will satisfy him uh, very fully. Uh, it means that only, and this is a crucial point, it means that only 8% went to businesses outside the financial sector, with a further 8% uh, funding 
uh, credit cards and personal loans. Uh, yet it, it is only this last six, the, the two eight percent, lending to businesses and consumer credit, that has a real impact on GDP and economic growth. Only that 16 percent. The conclusion, I think, is unavoidable. We cannot continue with a system where so little of the money created by banks is used for the purposes of economic growth and value creation, and instead, and I'm picking up the point that the Honourable Gentleman made a moment ago, the overwhelming majority of the money created uh, has the effect of inflating property prices and therefore pushing up the cost of living. Now, in a nutshell, the banks have too much power and they have greatly abused it. <laughs> Firstly, they have been granted enormous privileges since they can create wealth simply by writing an accounting entry on a register and they decide uh, who uses that wealth and for what purpose. And they have used their power of credit creation to hugely favour property and consumption lending over business investment because the returns are higher and more secure and thus the banks maximise their own interest but not the national interest. Secondly, if they fail to meet their liabilities, they are not penalised. Someone else pays up for them. The first £85,000 uh, of deposits are covered by a guarantee underwritten by the state and in the event of a major financial crash, they are bailed out by the implicit taxpayer guarantee. Just let me finish and I'll of course give way. Uh, they've been encouraged by this into much more risky, uh, even reckless investment, uh, especially in the case of exotic financial derivatives. Um, it's beginning to queue up, but just let me finish. Uh, and. Uh, even to the point where after the financial crash of 2008-9, the state was obliged to undertake direct bailout costs of nearly £70 billion, plus provide a further uh, near £1 trillion in support for loan guarantees, liquidity schemes and asset protection arrangements. Of course, I give way. I wholly, wholly agree with the, what he's just said. The moral hazard problem here is absolutely enormous and most, one, one of the most fundamental problems. I just would share with him that the British Bankers Association picked me up when I said it was a state-funded deposit insurance scheme. They told me it was industry-funded. I think the issue now is that nobody really believes for a moment that this scheme will actually not be backstopped by the taxpayer. Well, I'm, as always, very grateful for the intervention. Uh, I was going to say my honourable friend, uh, but on this I think he probably is. Now, given that, I think it raises the question at the heart of this debate. I mean, who should create the money? Uh, and I just ask this question. Would Parliament ever have voted to delegate power to create money to those same banks that caused the horrendous financial crisis from which the world is still suffering? I think the answer to that is unambiguously no. So the question then that needs to be put is, how should we achieve the switch from unbridled consumerism uh, to a framework of productive investment capable of generating a successful and sustainable manufacturing uh, and industrial base which can securely underpin UK living standards. Now the two models uh, which have been hitherto used to operate such a system. One was the centralised direction of finance uh, used, and I have to say extremely successfully, <laughs> um, by several Asian countries, especially the Southeast Asian uh, so-called tiger economies, um, after the Second World War to achieve takeoff. But I'm not suggesting that that method is appropriate for us today. It's not suited to advanced industrial democracies. The other was to bring about, uh, through official guidance, uh, guidance in inverted commas, the rationing of bank credit in accordance with national targets which, uh, wh and where necessary through quantitative um, direct controls. This was a policy which did work well for a quarter of a century in the UK in the post-world period until the 1970s when it was steadily replaced by the purely market system of competition and credit control uh, based exclusively on interest rates 
which has, in our experience of the last 30, 40 years, proved deeply unstable, dysfunctional, and profoundly costly. I'll give one moment. Since then, there have been uh, sporadic attempts uh, to create a safer banking system, but these have been deeply flawed. Either regulation uh, under the dictates of the neoliberal ideology has been ever so light touch, and I have to say by New Labour just as much as by the other government, that it has been entirely ineffective. Uh, all the regulation is so detailed. Uh, Basel III, I would remind the House, has more than 400 pages. Uh, and the US Dodd-Frank's bill uh, has a staggering 8,000 pages or more that it is impossibly bureaucratic, impossibly bureaucratic, and almost certainly full of loopholes. All the regulation was so cautious, like the Vickers Commission uh, proposal of Chinese walls between the investment and retail uh, arms uh, of a bank, that it, in my view, frankly, really missed the main point. Or whatever route was tried, and this is very significant, it faced the regulatory arbitrage uh, at the hands of the phalanx of lawyers and accountants in the city, earning their ill-gotten bonuses by unpicking or circumventing whatever regulatory safeguards the authorities put in place. Now, against that background, there are solid grounds, I think, for examining, and this is where I do come to my proposal, uh, the creation of a sovereign monetary system as recommended by several expert commentators recently. Uh, Martin Wolf, uh, who as everyone uh, in this house will know is an influential chief economics commentator of the FT, uh, wrote an article a few months ago on the 24th of April to be precise entitled Strip Private Banks of Their Power to Create Money. This is from Martin Wolf recommending switching from bank-created debt to a nationalised money supply. Also, Lord Adair Turner, who was a former chair of the Financial Services Authority, uh, delivered a speech um, about 18 months ago in February 2013 discussing an alternative uh, to quantitative easing, uh, which he turned overt money finance, uh, which is also known as a form of sovereign money. Now, such a system, and here I will describe its main outline, such a system would restrict the power to create all money to the state via the central bank. Changes to the rules governing how banks operate would still permit them to make loans, but would make it impossible for them to create new money in the process. The central bank would continue to follow the remit uh, set by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, which is currently to deliver price stability, which is defined at the present time uh, as inflation target of 2%. The central bank would be exclusively responsible for creating as much new money as was necessary to support non-inflationary growth. Decisions on money creation would be taken independently of government, uh, by a newly formed uh, Monetary Creation Committee or by the existing uh, Monetary Policy Committee, either of which would be accountable uh, to the Treasury Select Committee. And I think that uh, accountability to the House is crucial to this whole process. Yes, I give way to my little friend again. Would, um, coming back to the, the original question I asked them earlier on, what role would the Bank of England have in this? Oh, the, the bank, um, I, I'm coming on to explain, the Bank of England has an absolutely crucial role. If he listens to the, in fact, the last bit of my speech, he will get a full answer for that question. A sovereign money system thus offers, if I may say this, a clear thermostat to balance the economy, which is notoriously lacking at present. In times when the economy uh, is in recession uh, or growth is slow, uh, the Money Creation Committee will be able to increase the rate of money creation uh, to boost aggregate demand. If growth is very high and inflationary pressures are increasing, uh, they, can slow it, they can slow down the rate of money creation. Now that is a, a, a crucial improvement over the present system whereby the banks will either produce too much mortgage credit in a boom because of the high profit prospects, which produces a housing bubble and raises house prices, or they produce too little credit in a recession, which exacerbates the lack of demand. 
Now, as to lending to businesses, which I think is uh, central to this whole debate... Yes. yes. I'm sorry, I just want to take you back just a, a few moments, because he mentioned about accountability to Parliament, and I think he said the Select Committee. I, I just wonder whether, would, yeah, I just wonder whether would, would I just really just enlarge on that a little bit and say, when he says accountable, what powers would Parliament have to ensure that this was followed through in a proper way and with the rules that, that's been, been laid down? Uh, the purpose of uh, accountability uh, to the Treasury Select Committee uh, is to uh, enable Parliament fully to explore the manner in which the uh, Money Creation Committee is, or the Monetary <coughs> Policy Committee is working. And I would anticipate a full three hours uh, discussion uh, with uh, the leading officials of those committees before the Treasury Select Committee uh, and if necessary they could be given a hard time. Certainly uh, these persons who I would see as the most competent uh, persons in this House to deal with the matter uh, would make clear what their priorities were, would make clear where they thought the Money Creation Committee was not giving uh, sufficient attention to the way in which it uh, was operating, and would suggest changes. They wouldn't have the power formally to compel the Money Creation Committee to change, but I think the whole point about uh, select committees, uh, which are televised and discussed within the media, uh, would have a very big effect. But it's a, it's a major change compared to what we have at the present time. It, like all systems, if it is inadequate, uh, it can be modified, changed, uh, and increasingly enforced. Now, if I could really get on to this question of uh, lending to businesses, which, uh, after the experience we've had uh, in the last decade or more, last half decade, has been very, very unsatisfactory. The central bank, under a sovereign monetary system, would be empowered to create money for the express purpose of that funding role. The money would be lent to banks with the requirement that the funds are used for productive purposes. Whilst lending for speculative purposes, for example to purchase pre-existing assets, either financial or property, would not be allowed. The central bank could also create and lend funds to other intermediaries, and the Honourable Gentleman for uh, Wickham referred to this, such as regional or publicly owned business banks, which would ensure that a floor, a floor could be placed uh, under the level of uh, lending to businesses, which would be a great relief, I think, to British business today, guaranteeing support for the real economy. And I should add that within the limits imposed, and this is, again, uh, I say this to avoid misunderstanding, uh, within the limits imposed by the central bank on the broad purposes for which money may be lent, lending decisions would be entirely at the discretion of the lending institutions, not of the government or the central bank. Now, I conclude that I believe a sovereign monetary system offers a very considerable advantages over the present system. Uh, it would create a better and safer banking system because banks would have an incentive to take lower levels of risk since there would be no option of a bailout or rescue from taxpayers and thus moral hazard uh, would be reduced. Second, it would increase economic stability uh, because money creation by banks tends to be pro-cyclical uh, as I've explained, whereas money creation by the central bank would be counter-cyclical. Thirdly, sovereign money crucially supports the real economy when under the current system 83% of lending does not at the moment go into productive investment. I underline that three times. The fourth point, and I've only got five in case members are wearying, uh, the fourth point under the current system, house price bubbles transfer wealth, as we all know from the uh, young to the old and from those who can't get on the property ladder uh, to existing house owners, which increases wealth inequality, whilst removing the ability of banks to create money should dampen house price rises and thus reduce the rate of wealth inequality. My fifth and, and last point, which I think is a very important one, sovereign money redresses a major democratic deficit. Under the present system, around just 80 board members across the largest five banks uh, 
make decisions that shape the entire UK economy, even though these individuals have no obligation or mandate to consider the needs of society or the economy as a whole and are not accountable in any way to the public. It is for the maximisation of their own interests and not to those of the national interest. Now, under, a sovereign, uh, under sovereign money, the Money Creation Committee would be highly transparent, we've discussed this already, and accountable uh, to Parliament. So for all of these reasons, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I believe that the examination of the merits uh, of, sovereign, of a sovereign monetary system is now urgently needed, and I would call on the government to set up a commission on money and credit with particular reference to the potential benefits of sovereign money, which offers a way out of the continuing and worsening financial crises that have blighted this country and indeed the whole international economy for decades. The third distinctive feature of banks is that which was highlighted by my uh, honourable friend, that banks create money. The vast majority of money consists of bank deposits. If your bank lends your company uh, uh, £10 million, it does not need to go and borrow that money from a saver. It simply creates an extra £10 million by electronically crediting your bank account or the company's bank account with £10 million. It creates £10 million out of thin air. By contrast, when you repay an existing bank loan, that extinguishes money. It disappears into thin air. So the total money supply increases when banks create new loans faster than old loans are being repaid, and that's where growth in the money supply comes from normally. It's the normal situation in a growing economy. Ideally, credit should expand so that the supply of money grows sufficiently rapidly to finance the growth in economic activity. But when a bank or banks collapse, they will call in loans, which will reduce the money supply, which in turn will cause a contraction of activity throughout the economy. So in that respect, banks are totally different from other companies, even companies which also lend things. If a car rental company collapses, it doesn't lead to a reduction in the number of cars available in the economy. Its stock of cars can be sold off to other rental companies or to individuals. Nor does the collapse of one rental company weaken the position of other car rental companies. On the contrary, they then uh, face less competition, which should strengthen their margins. Austin Mitchell. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I, I welcome this debate and I congratulate uh, my honourable friends on securing it, because it is time that we debated this issue. We haven't done so for uh, well over 100 years, so uh, it's nice to be able to do so. Uh, this House and the government are obsessed uh, with money uh, and the economy, but we never debate the creation of money uh, or the creation of credit. And we should do, because that's uh, when it comes to our present uh, economic situation and the, the, the way the banks are run and the way the economy is run, uh, the elephant in the room. Uh, it's uh, time to think outside, not the box, outside the banks, uh, and uh, to think about uh, credit creation uh, and money. Martin Wolf, an uh, interesting article cited by my, uh, my honourable friend, uh, has argued that uh, credit, uh, only the central bank should create new money, and it should be regulated by a public credit authority, rather like the Monetary Policy uh, Committee. I think that would be uh, a, a solution uh, and a possible approach. Why shouldn't we regulate uh, the issue of credit uh, in this kind of fashion? It brings us back to the old argument about uh, monetarism, whether uh, uh, money is uh, credit creation uh, is exogenous or endogenous. And, uh, the monetarists thought it was uh, exogenous, so all you have to do is cut off the supply of money or cut the supply of money uh, into the economy uh, and you bring inflation under control. Well, of course, that was a myth because you can't actually control the supply of money. It's endogenous and the plant, the, the economy, like a plant, sucks in uh, the money it needs. But that can be regulated uh, by uh, a public credit uh, 
authority so that the, the supply matches the needs of the economy rather than being excessive as it has been uh, over the last few years. Uh, so I think uh, that kind of credit authority needs to be created to regulate uh, the flow uh, of, of credit. Uh, if we create money, quantitative easing, go on and create more money, channel it through a national investment bank uh, into productive investment, uh, into contracts for house building, new town generation, infrastructure, massive infrastructure work, uh, I wouldn't include HS2 in that, but uh, let's say massive infrastructure work, uh, then uh, we can stimulate the economy, stimulate growth and achieve useful purposes which we haven't been able to achieve. This is a, here's a solution uh, to a lot of the problems that's bedeviled the Labour Party. How do we get investment uh, uh, without uh, a private financial initiative and the heavy burden that imposes on the health service, on schools, on all, uh, all kinds of uh, activities? Well, why not through quantitative easing? contracts for housing or infrastructure work which have a payoff point uh, and which produce uh, uh, an investment, which produce uh, uh, an asset uh, for, the, uh, for the state. So that's uh, my proposal uh, allocated uh, by the monetary uh, uh, policy, uh, creation policy, uh, sorry, committee. Uh, which I advocated earlier under uh, the article uh, from, uh, from Martin Wolf. That's, uh, I think, the way we should approach it. And I, I, that's why I welcome today's debate, because it has to be the beginning of a debate in which we open our minds to the possibilities of managing credit more effectively for the better building of the strength of the British economy. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'll speak very briefly. I, I want to uh, put on record my um, gratitude, I suppose, to the Honourable Member for Wickham for having initiated this debate and his co-sponsors from the various parties. And, and I must say, I'm, having heard his speech, or most of his speech, I apologise for being late, I'm even more satisfied that when I cast my vote for him to join the Treasury Select Committee, it was the right thing to do, uh, because he's introduced an incredibly important debate, and as has been mentioned already, this is an issue that has not been debated for well over a century, and I think we wouldn't be having this debate if it wasn't for the fact that we are uh, still in the midst of tumultuous times. We had the banking crash, we had the corresponding crash in confidence in the banking system and in the wider economy. And now we have a problem of, of, of underlending, partly as a consequence, particularly to small and medium-sized business. So this could not be more important. And the member for, uh, my, my, I'm going to say my honourable friend, because we work on many issues together, for Alderman Royton, uh, I pointed out at the beginning of his speech that, that this is an issue that is not well understood by members of the public. Well, and I think he could, was mentioned later on in his speech, but if he didn't, I'm going to add that this is an issue which is also not well understood by members of this House, by members of Parliament. Um, and, and I would include myself in that, and I suspect most people here would be humble enough to recognise that this is such a complex issue, this banking wizardry we're discussing today, that very few people really properly understand it. And if, yeah, please. I thank the Honourable Gentleman, and I totally associate his comments about ignorance, and I include myself in that. But it seems to me that the system is really broken. The system is broken because the banks won't lend money, because the government has told them they've got to keep reserves. We don't like quantitative easing because that means the banks aren't lending, therefore quantitative easing has to be. So there's something very wrong with the system. It is not, you know, if the system isn't broke, don't fix it. The system is broke, and someone's got to fix it. Um, he, may, uh, he makes some, uh, uh, a valuable point, and I'm going to be try, I'm gonna, in my very brief remarks, I'm going to come to that. But, but the point I was just about to make, that if members of Parliament don't really understand how money is created, and I really believe that is the majority position, certainly based on discussions 
I have been having. How on earth can we be confident that the reforms we brought in over the course of the last few years are going to work, are going to prevent repeat, repeat, repeat collapse of the sort which we saw before the last election? And, and my, my view is that we can't be confident, that it's, it's, it's the impulsive position of ignorant members. And again, I'm not intending to be rude to be. I, I include myself in that bracket, but the, the impulse uh, for so many people has been to simply call for more regulation, as if that's going to magic away these problems. But as, as my honourable friend mentioned, there were 8,000 pages of guidance in relation to one aspect of banking that he discussed in his speech. The problem is not lack of regulation, it's the fact that the regulations that exist miss, miss the goal in so many respects. And the problem has become so complex, so convoluted, banking, sorry, has become so complex, so convoluted, that we need an entirely different approach. And I would say the majority of people outside of Parliament, when you talk to them about, ba about banking, have a fairly simple view that the bank takes deposits and then lends, and, and that's the way it's always been. And, and of course there is an element of that, but it's so far removed from where we are today that it's only a very tiny element. And most people, or many people at least, understand factional reserve banking, which might have, yeah, please. But, but even factional reserve banking is just the start of the story. Uh, because as we've heard, and I'm not going to repeat in, in detail, but banks themselves create money. They do so, so by making advances, and with every advance they make a deposit. And this is something which I think is so poorly understood uh, by, by people outside and inside of this House. And it, it, this has conferred extraordinary power on the banks, and, and necessarily and naturally and understandably banks will use that power and have used that power in the interests of banks. But it's created extraordinary risk, and the risk, unfortunately, because of the size of the banks and because of the interconnectedness of the banks, the risk is on us, which is why I'm so excited by the challenges that my friend, my honourable friend has just described. But as I said, this is fringe, this is right on the edge. I mean, it's an extraordinary thing to, uh, thing to imagine that at the height of the collapse, that for every uh, twenty, that the banks held just £1.25 for every £100 they had lent out. So it, it, we, we are in a very precarious situation. I remember um, uh, when I was very, very much younger and I, I was listening to a discussion and not understanding most of it between my father and, and various people who were asking his advice. And he, was, he, had, he was a man who had a pretty good track record in terms of anticipating turbulence in the world's economy. And he was asked, when is the next crash going to happen? He said, the last person you ask is an economist or a businessman, you need to ask a psychiatrist because so much of it is around confidence. And I think the, the point was proven just a few years ago. So the, the banking system and the wider economy have become extraordinarily unhinged, detached from reality. And, and I think in, in a debate at another time, I'd like to elaborate on, on, on th this extraordinary situation where, where it, it is possible to imagine economic growth even as the last of the world's great e ecosystems, the last of the great forests, uh, come down. The, the, the economy is no longer linked to the reality of the natural world, which is the world on which all goods eventually derive. But I think that is probably a debate for another time, and I'm not going to dwell on that. But we did have... Yes, please. I, th I think the Honourable Gentleman may makes a an, an point there that we should remind ourselves of, and it was one that was brought, brought to me by a, an Icelandic publisher, uh, Bjorn Jonasson, who pointed out that we're not in a situation where any volcanoes have blown up. We're not in a situation of huge natural disasters, of famines, or of catastrophe brought on by war. It is, as was alluded to, I think, by a couple of his honourable colleagues, of, of a system failure. And it's a system failure within the rules. And I think it's just worth keeping that in mind. And in some ways, while, it's, while we have much gloom around the banking system, that in itself should give us some hope at the same time. Yeah, he, the, the, the Honourable Member is right, but, it, but it, there, there are. There are a, a growing number of, of, of commentators and voices out there who are anticipating a much larger crash than, than, than anything we've seen in the last few years. And I, I'm not going to uh, add or detract from the credence of those statements, but it's, it's possible to imagine how that might happen. Certainly ecological collapse, but we're talking about the banking system here, and the two are not, it, two, two are not entirely separate. But we did have a, a, a wake-up call just a few years ago, just, just before the election. My concern is that we haven't actually woken up, that it seems to me that we haven't introduced any significant meaningful reforms which go to the heart of the problems we're discussing today. It seems to me that we've been tinkering on the edges, and I don't believe Parliament has been as closely involved in that process as Parliament should be, partly because of the ignorance that I described at the beginning of my, of my remarks. So I, I, I just want to put on the record my support for a meaningful uh, a monetary commission of some sort to be established, or an equivalent of, where we are able to actually 
examine the pros and cons of shifting from a factional to something closer to a full reserve banking system, as a number of members have discussed today. This is something we need to understand. What are the pros and cons of such a move? How possible is that? Who wins? Who loses? I don't think many people really fully understand the answers. And I think we need to look at quantitative easing. It's been accepted, I think, by everyone on all sides of the House that quantitative easing is not objective. There are, there are those who believe it's a good and those who believe it's a bad, but no one believes it's objective. And if there is a majority view that quantitative easing, e easing is necessary, then we need to ask the question, why not use those funds, inject those funds into the real economy, into housing, into energy projects, and so on, of the kind of projects we've heard from the other side, as opposed to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, using the mechanism in such a way that clearly only benefits very few people within the financial banking wizardry uh, world that we're discussing today. So I think these issues need to be explored, and I think it is time for a monetary commission to be established, and for Parliament then to become much more engaged than we have been. This is a very small step in that direction. I'm very grateful to the sponsors of today's debate. I wish there were more people here today. I was intending to listen, not speak, uh, but there aren't all that many speakers, unfortunately, but it is the beginning, and I hope we'll have many more such debates. Thank you. The uh, Honourable Member uh, for Oldham West had made the point that uh, the whole approach to uh, quantitative easing, which many members have, uh, have, have, have questioned at a number of levels. Uh, but one thing that it does prove that is that, in many ways, the underlying logic of the concept of sovereign money creation uh, is actually uh, feasible and uh, workable. Uh, so those who dispute that, it is strange that some of those who uh, would dispute and refute uh, the case that is made around sovereign uh, money creation, sometimes there are people who then defend uh, quantitative easing. Uh, in the form and with the features that it uh, has actually had. And in many ways, what quantitative easing uh, has uh, shown is that if we are going to use the facility uh, of uh, the state and the state's main tool in this situation, obviously, is uh, the Bank of England uh, to uh, alter the money supply, to uh, prime uh, the money supply in a particular way, then we could have chosen much better. Uh, way of doing it than the form that was chosen uh, by quantitative uh, easing, because in a sense, while it is meant to have achieved uh, increases uh, in the money supply, where have people felt that in terms of business credit? Where have people felt that uh, in terms of wages, in terms uh, of consumer power and the stimulus that that uh, is able to provide? And so we basically look back on the financial crash and its aftermath. And we see evidence, and it's not just in the UK, it's in Ireland and it's in other places uh, as well, uh, where a lot of what we were being told up until the crash was the worth and the wealth of particular sectors in the economy has turned out to be uh, vacuous, but the poverty that lays in its trail uh, is actually vicious. Uh, so the wealth and the worth hasn't been real, uh, but the poverty is. And so people then rightly. Uh, question. People like Positive Money UK or Sensible Money uh, in Ireland uh, are saying, well, maybe uh, how we treat the creation uh, of money and how uh, politics and those of us who are charged with meant to be overseeing public policy as it affects uh, the economy uh, need to have a more basic look uh, at how we are treating uh, the banking system and the very nature of money creation. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I wanted to start very much by congratulating the Honourable Member for uh, Wickham on his uh, very thoughtful and thorough opening speech, um, but also the Honourable Member uh, for Oldham, Western Brighton, my Honourable Friend, um, at, uh, for, for his uh, speech from this side of the House also, um, but also uh, now in their absence, um, the Honourable Member for Brighton Pavilion and Clacton for securing today's uh, very important debate. Um, it has been. Um, uh, for this, I mean, this debate obviously comes following a significant campaign by Positive Money, who have been raising some extremely important issues about how we ensure financial stability, or how we, as parliamentarians, and indeed how members of the public, can gain a far greater understanding of the way in which our economy works, and in particular how money is supplied, not just in this country but around the world as well. 
Uh, we've seen from today's debate that uh, some very important questions have been highlighted, and I think not all have been answered uh, in this debate. Questions about how our money is created, how that money or credit is used by banks and others, how our financial system can be more transparent and accountable, um, but particularly how it can actually benefit the country as a whole. And it's on that latter point in particular that um, I know particularly this side of the House have been uh, acutely focused on how we rework our economy, whether it's in the field of banking, whether it's in relation to jobs, whether it's in relation to wages, so that it does actually work for the country as a whole. Um, I think, though, um, it'd be worth reflecting just for a moment on uh, the system that we currently have in this country and what it means for money creation. Because, as the Honourable Member for Wickham set out very eloquently in his opening speech, we know that currency is created in the conventional sense of being printed by the Bank of England, but commercial banks can create money by ways of account holders depositing money into their accounts or by issuing loans to borrowers, which obviously increases the amount of money that's available to borrowers and within the wider economy. And as the Bank of England made clear in an article accompanying their first quarterly bulletin in 2014 this year, when a bank makes a loan to one of its customers, it simply credits the customer's account with a higher deposit balance. At that instant, new money is created. So bank loans and deposits are essentially IOUs from the banks and therefore a form of money creation. However, we know that commercial banks do not have unlimited abilities to create money. Monetary policy, financial stability and regulation all influence the amount of money that commercial banks can create. In that sense, they are um, regulated by the Prudential Regulation Authority, part of the Bank of England, and the Financial Conduct Authority. And these regulators, um, some of which are quite rightly independent, are the stewards of safety and soundness in financial institutions, especially regarding banks' money-creating practices. And it remains our view that the central issue here, the instability of money supply within the banking system, is less to do with the powers that the banks hold and the way in which they create money effectively, but more to do with the way the banks conduct themselves and whether they actually act in the public interest in, the way, in, in other ways as well. So we believe that the issues here are about the incentives that are in place for banks to ensure that loans and debts are repaid, that they're only granted when there is a strong likelihood of repayment, when the money supply increases rapidly with no uh, certainty of repayment, then that is when real risks emerge in the economy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And uh, I would like to also add my congratulations. This has been a really fascinating debate and one that is very long overdue, and that is to actually consider not just what more we can do to improve what we have, but whether, in fact, we should be throwing it away and starting again. And I do genuinely welcome the debate, and I do hope that there will be many more to follow. And I'd also like to pay tribute to the Honourable Member for Oldham for his uh, good explanation of the positive money agenda which is certainly an, an idea worthy of thought, and I will come on to that. So um, I want to start by saying money creation is a very important and complex aspect of our economy that I do agree with members is very often misunderstood. So I'd like to very quickly set out how the system works at present. The money held by households and companies takes two forms, currency, which is banknotes and coins, and bank deposits. The vast majority, as my honourable friend for Wickham pointed out, is in the form of bank deposits. A honourable friend is right to say that bank deposits are primarily created by commercial banks themselves each time they make a loan. Whenever a bank makes a loan, it credits the borrower's bank account with a new deposit, and that creates new money. However, there are limits to how much new money is created at any point in time. When a bank makes a loan, it obviously does so under the expectation that this loan will be repaid in the future. Households repay their mortgages out of their salaries. Business is repay their loans out of income from their investments. In other, in other words, banks will not create new money unless they think at the time that new value will also in due course be created, enabling that loan to be paid back. 
So ultimately, money creation depends on the policies of the Bank of England. Changes to the bank rate affect market interest rates and in turn the saving and borrowing decisions of households and businesses. And the idea is that prudential regulation is used if excessive risk-taking or asset price bubbles are creating excessive lending. But first, I just want to briefly set out why we don't believe that the right solution is the wholesale replacement of the current system by something else, such as a sovereign monetary system. Under a sovereign monetary system, it would be the state, not banks, creating new money. The central bank, via a committee, would decide how much money is created, and this money would mostly be transferred to the government. Lending would come from the pool of customers' investment account deposits held by commercial banks. Such a system would raise a number of very important <laughs> questions. How would that committee assess how much money should be created to meet the inflation target and support the economy? If the central bank had the power to finance government's policies, what would the implications be for the credibility of the fiscal framework and the government's ability to borrow from the market if it needed to? What would be the impact on the availability of credit for businesses and households? Wouldn't credit become very pro-cyclical? Wouldn't we incentivise financing households over businesses? Because in the case of businesses, banks would presumably expect the state to step in. Wouldn't we be encouraging the emergence of an unregulated set of new shadow banks? And wouldn't the introduction of a totally new system, untested across modern advanced economies, create unnecessary risk at a time when what people need is stability? I will give way. I'll just make a couple of points. I don't actually support Positive Money's proposals, as they know, although I'm glad to work with them because I support their diagnosis of the problem. But in 1844, <laughs> of course, they could have advanced this argument, and they didn't. Uh, but the, the, the final point, really, is to say that I, of course, haven't proposed throwing away the system and doing something radically new. I've proposed getting rid of all of the obstacles to the free market creating alternative currencies. I'm grateful to my honourable friend for pointing that out, and I, I must confess, before this debate, I was rather puzzled by the fact that such an intelligent and extremely sensible person as he should be making the case for what I would see in a sovereign monetary system, for an extraordinarily state interventionist um, new proposal. So I'm very glad to hear that that's not uh, what he's proposing. And of course, bearing in mind our current set of regulators, we would presumably then be looking at a committee of middle-aged white men making the decision on what the economy needs and that also would be a significant concern to me were that to happen. So my own position, which I, I will of course give way to. My, uh, before, before, the, before the Minister um, leaves the whole question of um, sovereign monetary system, which obviously she is totally opposed to and raised several objections which I cannot in an intervention answer uh, but does she not believe at the present time that the system of bank uh, money creation uh, is highly Highly pro-cyclical and has enormously benefited uh, property and financial sectors to the disadvantage of the vast range of industry outside the financial sector. As I, as I said at the beginning, I sincerely congratulate the Honourable Member for raising this issue. It is certainly one that's worthy of discussion. I look forward to him um, coming back on some of the arguments that I've raised. But very specifically, yes, I also agree with him that where we were in the run-up to the financial crisis was entirely inappropriate. And I will come on to some of the steps that we've taken to improve, not throw away the baby with the bathwater, but to improve what we have now, rather than throw it away and start again. So I know that... Um, in addition, some of my honourable friends and, and members opposite have a particular concern about quantitative easing, as I'm on the record of, uh, as having made clear that I do too, and specifically how you might unwind it. But they should surely agree that at least quantitative easing can be unwound, unlike the proposal of helicopter money, which seems to me to be a giant step beyond quantitative easing, a step where money would be created by the state with no obvious way then to rein it back if necessary. Necessary. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, if the tap in my bathroom breaks, rather than wrenching the sink off the wall, I would prefer to fix the tap. And I think, as Martin Wolfe said last week, nobody can say with confidence how a monetary system should be structured and what laws and regulations it should have. Given that, and also the tumult going on economically across the world, we should be devoting our energies to fixing the system we have, mending the problems, but keeping what works. So in conclusion, 
This government's belief is that the current system, modified and improved with far greater competition, is the one that will serve the economy best. Reform is vital. Again, as Andy Haldane puts it, historically, flexing policy frameworks has often been taken as a sign of regime failure. Quite the opposite ought to be the case. We need banks to lend to young families wanting to buy houses and repay them out of future labour income, rather than relying on the bank of mum and dad, or for businesses wanting to seize opportunities, gain new markets and create jobs and growth. Our existing system offers a forward-looking and dynamic framework in which tomorrow's opportunities are not wholly reliant on yesterday's savings, and it builds on the expertise of banks in assessing risks and making the lending decisions that we badly need. In 25 years myself, in the heart of the financial sector, I saw it at its best and sadly sometimes also at its worst. We are trying to remedy the worst, but Madam Deputy Speaker, let's also keep the best. Thank you.